All right, so today is the second lecture now on concurrency shared protocols. Uh, so now we're looking at the other class of concurrency protocols called timestamp ordering. So just as a reminder for everyone, uh, homework four is due a week from today on November uh, 13th. And then project three is due next week on the 15th. Does anybody have any questions about project three? Yes. So His question is, for project three, have we already covered everything that you need to know for project three? Yes, so everything would have, would have been covered last week. Right, you have to do two-phase locking, right, as you build a lock manager to, and you know, implement the internals of the, the lock manager, so when requests come in, you make a decision about whether to deny it or grant it. And then you have to do latch grabbing on, on your B plus tree. In the back, yes. His que so your question is, the, the weight die policy for the, in the textbook is vague? Like, can, can you be more specific? Like some cases that, like, it could be left up to, like, how you want to do it. Um, so let's take this offline. It should be straightforward. Maybe, maybe I'm missing, missing something. Yeah, I can ask later. Okay. Oh, for the upgrades? Is that what's confusing about? I see what you're saying. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's, let's take this offline, and then we'll update the, the to-do, or the, the, the project specification. OK, then we'll, we should talk about uh, lock upgrades as well. OK. So any other questions? All right. So the, again, this, to, to ground you with where we're at in, in the, the semester, right? we introduced concurrency control as the mechanism that the data system is going to use to allow multiple transactions to run at the same time and to update and read from the database, but then we'll have the illusion that they are running in isolation, running by themselves, right? And we said this before, that if you, this is when you, you're running at serializable isolation, the strongest guarantee you can provide. Um, and so last week, we talked about two-phase locking, um, where we said this was a pessimistic protocol where the transactions have to acquire the locks on the objects that they want to read or write to before the data system lets them actually do that, right? And then the two phases were that you acquire the locks in, in the growing phase, and then as soon as you release one lock, now you're in the shrinking phase. And then we said there was two-phase locking where you just hold the locks to, to the very end. So today we're talking about timestamp ordering, right? So th this is considered an optimistic protocol where we're not going to use any locks at all, Although you can argue the timestamps that we'll maintain are essentially locks, but that's, that's getting into semantics. But there's no locks at all, and you're going to assume that transactions aren't going to conflict, and you're going to let them just run. And you have to ma maintain some metadata to say what the transaction was doing while it runs, and then when you go to commit, you just check to see whether uh, those guarantees, or th those, those requirements about the timestamp ordering was, was, uh, was, was uh, still, still satisfied. So there are a couple, there's, bit, I'm going to talk about two types of, actually three types of, of time step ordering protocol. I would say the first one I'm going to describe will be uh, sort of the, the, again, the standard textbook de definition. Um, and then we'll talk about what the, the more complicated one. And then we'll talk about another variant that's actually used in some, some more recent systems. So again, the high, high level idea of time step ordering is that, again, we're going to use, we're going to assign transactions timestamps. And that's going to allow us to figure out what should be the order of their operations. And when I say order, I mean that, it's, again, it's the order that they're applied to the database. The database system is still allowed to interleave them in any, any way that it wants. Again, as long as it produces a schedule that's equivalent to one of, 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 of a schedule that produces a database that's equivalent to one that's generated by a serial ordering of our transactions. So what we're going to introduce is this new uh, timestamp function, TS, and for a given transaction handle or transaction ID, uh, we, we, will, we will generate a, a unique timestamp for it. Right? And that, so in our purposes, when we say like T, T1, we'll say its timestamp is 1, right? and, and a bunch of examples. Right? And so the idea here is that if the timestamp of the first transaction, TI, if that's less than the timestamp of transaction, TJ, then the serial order would be one where TI is executed first, 
followed by TJ. Again, we can use these timestamps to figure out when these would occur. And the high level idea to think about this is that we're assigning these timestamps on a per transaction basis, and a transaction can consist of one or more operations. So we don't need to know about the individual timestamps of individual steps. It's really just about the, the transaction and all, and all its uh, subsequent steps. So the way you would assign a, uh, a, a timestamp is uh, through a couple of different ways. But at a high level, the, the key thing is that the timestamp always has to be unique for a transaction. Right? We can't have transaction, you know, the first transaction start at timestamp one, the second transaction start, start at timestamp two or one as well, right? Because those timestamps would be equal, and then we can't make any decision about how to interleave their operations. Right? So they always have to be unique. Uh, it always has to be fixed for the transaction. I mean, if we assign the transaction a timestamp at that moment, right? Uh, Later on, the transaction keeps on running, it can't get a new timestamp. There are some variants of timestamp ordering protocols that, that, where you can do that, but for our, purpose, our purposes in this lecture, for you guys to understand how timestamp ordering works, we'll assume that it's fixed. And then the other key thing is that the timestamp always has to be increasing. So if we give a transaction timestamp 10, if there's some weird clock anomaly where all of a sudden we, the, you know, the clock drifts and we reset it with NTP or whatever, we can't now start assigning tra transactions timestamp uh, two, right? Because that, that, would, that would sort of foul up this protocol. Now, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this today, but I can talk about it in next lecture. Uh, there's obviously a problem uh, of wraparound, right? If you have 32-bit timestamps, at some point, you're gonna have to come back to zero. Uh, Postgres hits this problem quite, quite often. Uh, and, they, and actually, in recent years, they've done a lot of good work making it, making it much better. Um, but if, again, for our purposes, to sort of keep things simple, just assume that the timestamp's always increasing up to infinity. So there's a bunch of different ways of how you can implement the timestamp allocator in your system. Uh, the most simplest way is to use the system clock, right? You, you can go to the, 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 the OS and say, give me the current system time. Um, and it, it can give you back that as, uh, as milliseconds or maybe microseconds. Uh, there are, in the newer Intel CPUs, there's the RD, RDTS or RDTC instruction that'll give you a sort of hardware timestamp. It doesn't map to actual the physical time, it's just the, the counter on the CPU. And again, same thing, it's always in, in increasing order. And that's actually much cheaper to do than get the system time because that's a single instruction. Uh, you could also do this with a logical counter. So you could have a single global variable that's just a counter, and every time you need to allocate a new timestamp, you just add plus one to it over and over again. Um, or you can use a combination of, of these two. So in some systems, you can go say, give me the current time in, in milliseconds, and then I'll have a, a, a global counter that you increase, the logical global counter you increase for that millisecond tick. And this allows you to assign timestamps for transactions, uh, multiple timestamps for transactions in the same uh, millisecond. If you're executing transactions very quickly, then you would want something like this. Um, the different systems do different things. Uh, the, the hybrid one is probably the best approach. We won't talk about this in, in, in this for this semester, but this will come up again in the, in the advanced class. Right, the problem with the system clock, obviously, is going to the kernel, get the OS is an expensive call. The, the RD, RDTS TC instruction makes this cheaper. Um, but then you have to have the wraparound issue we'll, we'll talk about next class. All right, so uh, there's actually th three protocols I want to talk about today. So there's basic timestamp ordering, and then optimistic concurrency control, which is sort of an advanced version of timestamp ordering. And then the third one I forgot to put here is sort of partition-based timestamp ordering. Um, it's actually turned, that last protocol actually turns out to be the most simplest to understand. Um, and in some cases, it's actually the fastest. But OCC is usually the one that people implement. And when we see this, when we talk about multi-version concurrent control in next class, most of the modern database systems that have come out in the last 10 years or so all use the, the, the OCC one, the, the middle guy, um, but in a, in a, in a multi-version se uh, setting. And so one thing that's always problematic also too when we talk about timestamp ordering protocols is that uh, the language gets reused, right? So the class of protocols we're talking about today are timestamp ordering protocols of which there is a protocol called the basic timestamp ordering protocol. Or, and all of these are considered optimistic schemes and technically are optimistic concurrency control schemes, but there's a protocol called optimistic concurrency control. So I'll, I'll try to be very clear as I go along, Again, but for basic TO and OCC 
These are specific implementations of algorithms and protocols that fall under the category of timestamp ordering. OK? OK. So the basic timestamp ordering protocol is that the transactions are going to be able to read and write objects in our database without locks. And then what's going to happen is we're going to maintain these timestamp tags for every single object in our database that corresponds to the, the, the timestamp of the last transaction that read or wrote to that object. And then every time now a transaction wants to read an object, it has a timestamp, and it compares its timestamp with either the read timestamp or the write timestamp of the object it's trying to access. And then that is used to determine whether uh, it's allowed to do that or not. Right? So again, when I said before that this is not using locks as we understood them under two-phase locking, but in some ways, setting the read and write timestamp is sort of like an implicit lock. Like it prevents someone from doing something that you don't want them to do. But you don't have to release the lock uh, in the same way you do in two-phase locking. So once you set the read timestamp because the, or the write timestamp after you completed your operation, you can keep on going and do whatever else you want you to do in your transaction. But anybody else that comes along has to check themselves, check their timestamp against yours to see whether you're, uh, they're allowed to do that. All right, so to do reads, uh, the basic idea is that if the timestamp of our transaction that we're trying to run, if their timestamp is uh, less than the right timestamp of the last transaction that wrote to this object, then we're essentially trying to read into the future, which should not be allowed under serial ordering, right? So if this occurs, if, if, you, if your check fails this constraint, then the database system will have to abort you and then when you restart, you'll come along with the same timestamp because now you'll be the older one um, and you can sort of keep, on, uh, keep, keep make, making forward progress. Uh, if you are less than that, then you're allowed to read the object, but then you're also updated read timestamp if your timestamp is greater than the, the, the current read timestamp. So what I mean by that is, again, these timestamps always have to be going in increasing order. So if I'm transaction one, I have timestamp one, and you're transaction two, if you read object X and you set the read timestamp to, uh, to, to, to one, or sorry, to two, and I come along and I now try to set it to one, uh, we don't want that to happen because now the reads are going back in time. And it's as if the read from the second transaction, although it occurred first, it's if, as if it, it actually disappears. And this causes problems in the protocol. Now, one additional thing that we have to do under basic timestamp ordering that you're not going to do under two-phase locking is that you're going to have to copy the object that you read into a sort of, I'm going to use the term private workspace or a local buffer for your transaction. Because that way, if you go back and read that same object again, uh, you'll, you'll be guaranteed that you have, you'll get the same value. Now, this is essentially like sort of a, a variant of multi-versioning, which we'll talk about on, on Wednesday. But we just need to do this because there's, nothing, there's no locks on the object. I read the object once at timestamp one. Then transaction two, timestamp two, comes along and writes to it. When I come back and try to read it again, my old value got overwritten. And so I, I would have to abort because now I'd be reading something that I shouldn't be able to read. So to avoid that, if you want to have repeatable reads with less aborts, you essentially just make a copy of the object you read and put it in your local buffer. Yes, in the back. Presumably, if you were using one of the lower isolation levels, you would skip that? Yes. So the point is, if you're running it at a lower isolation level, uh, so this would be read committed, right? If you're running it read committed or less, then you don't have to do this, right? You have, you have to do this to maintain serialized, serializable isolation level. All right, now for writes, it's essentially the same thing, but we have to check both the read timestamp of our object uh, and the write timestamp of the object as well. Right? So the read timestamp basically says that if our transaction is trying to write to an object, but there's a transaction in the future that already read the current value that we want to replace, then we have to abort ourselves because we would write something that the other transaction didn't see which it should have if we were executing things in serial order. And the same thing for the write timestamp. If we try to write to the object, uh, 
and are overriding a modification made by a transaction in the future, then that again violates the serializable ordering or serial ordering because that right should our right should occur before the other one, but in real time the the, the second right actually occurred first. So by checking both the read timestamp and the write timestamp, you prevent from over, overwriting things uh, from future transactions, and you prevent future transactions from not being able to read your writes. So for this, if you're allowed to do the write, you don't take the max of the write timestamp. You always set it to whatever you are, right? Because we do that additional check to make sure that our write timestamp is uh, our write timestamp is greater than the current one. So that guarantees that the write timestamp of the object is always in increasing order, always increasing. And again, the same thing if you want to ensure that you have repeatable reads, if you're running on the serializable isolation level, then you make the copy of the transactions, uh, make the copy of the object in the transaction buffer. This idea of the private workspace will be the, the, the key idea of OCC, which we'll talk about next. All right, so let's look at a really basic example here, right? So you have two transactions, T1, T2. Uh, T1 wants to read A, or sorry, read B, then read A, and then transaction T2 wants to read B, write B, then read A, and write A. So the first thing to point out is that in, under basic timestamp ordering, at the moment the transaction starts, the database system will assign it its timestamp. This is not true for all timestamp ordering protocols, but it's true for this one. So let's say now we have a single thread. Right, and this little blue arrow will represent you know, the, the current location of where that thread is executing these two transactions. So T1 starts, it does a read on B, and then we go now in our database and see, again, we have the object. At this point, we don't care what the values are. We just have the read timestamp and the write timestamp. And assume that this database system started and there was some transaction that inserted both these values and it had timestamp zero. So now to do this read, we'll flip the, we'll do our check to make sure that our current timestamp for T1 is 1, is greater than the read timestamp of this uh, and the write timestamp. And we go ahead and update the read timestamp to say now a transaction at timestamp 1 was able to read this object. Now we switch over to transaction T2. T2 starts. Uh, it wants to do a read on B. And again, same thing. The read timestamp is in the past. So we know that there isn't a transaction in the future that read us. So we're allowed to go ahead and then update the read timestamp for this object to now be 2. Then we do a write on B, and again, we do the same to check. Our write timestamp is zero, so we can overwrite that. And the read timestamp is two, which is us, so that's fine. So we go ahead and allow to write this object, and then we update the write timestamp to two. Now we switch over here, and transaction uh, T1 wants to read A. Again, all the same checks as before, so that's fine. Then we switch back here and do a read on A, and then a write on A. And that's fine. And then there's no violations for either of these two transactions under the timestamp ordering protocol. So both of these transactions are allowed to commit. Right? And this is equivalent to one where T1 ran first, did read on, a, read on B, read on A, followed by transaction T2. Right? That would have been the, the equivalent serial ordering for the, this particular schedule. All right, so this is another example here. So now we have uh, transaction T1 wants to do a read on A and write on A. And transaction T2 wants to do a write on A. Again, same thing. We start with T1. Uh, it does a read on A. We update the read timestamp for the object. Now we do a write on A in transaction T2. So now we set its write timestamp to 2. So now when we flip back over to T1 and it wants to do the write, uh, we have a violation here because now the timestamp of our transaction that's trying to update this object is less than the timestamp of the transaction that last wrote to that object. And that would violate the, the basic timestamp ordering protocol. So we know that we're going to have to uh, abort transaction T1 because it's not allowed to overwrite that value that T2 wrote to. Because that would not be equivalent to a serial ordering. Is this clear? All right, so what's a really simple optimization we could do here? The back. Exactly, yes. So he said that in the case here, if we just ignored the write on A by T1 and just let the, the write from T2 persist, that's, a, you know, that's, that's fine because nobody would ever see that write from T1 anyway because it would be neatly overwritten by T2. So therefore, we'd be equivalent to a, a serial order or be, we'd be serializable.
Yes. So his statement is, if there, if there, yes, if there's another transaction that slips through, yes, and if it reads that write that it shouldn't, right? If it should have read the, 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 the write by T1 and not the write by T2, actually, no, even, even then that wouldn't happen because T3 would be in the future because it would get timestamp 3. So therefore, it would never be able to read the write from T1 anyway because serial ordering would specify that you have to read from T2's write, not T1's write. Okay, so what essentially he described is actually has a name, and it's called Thomas Wright Rule. So some guy in the late 1970s, I don't know if he's still alive, basically came up with this, this basic idea of, of doing these, the, ignoring these rights that would never be read anyway. Right? So now we want, want to do a write. We want to first check to see whether our, uh, our timestamp is less than the current, time, uh, current read timestamp of the object. If so, then we know someone read in the future. Uh, and would miss our write, so we have to kill ourselves and abort. Uh, if our write timestamp of the object we want to modify is greater than our timestamp, then under the Thomas Wright rule, we can ignore the write, just not apply it at all, let the transaction sort of think it did the write, even though it actually didn't, and we can let it keep on running, and it'll be able to commit without any problems. And this obviously violates the, the, the protocol, the, the basic timestamp warning protocol guarantees, but in our particular example here, this is okay. So we go back to this example 404, right? Do the same thing. We do the read on A in transaction T1, flip over to T2, now does the write on, on A. Then we come to T, T1 and tries to do the write on A. And then we just not even do the update at all, right? If we're maintaining a private buffer workspace for the transaction, we'll apply the write there. So it tries to read the same thing, it'll get it. Uh, but nobody else will, will see this write. Everyone will see the write made by uh, uh, transaction T2. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, if T2 did a read instead of, instead of a write, would it have to abort? Yes. So you're saying T2 got the wrong value in this example? Yeah. All right, so, so her statement is, if I change this write in transaction T2, if I change that to a read, right, the way the protocol works is I do my read, I check to see the read timestamp, it's one at this point, all right, at this point in the schedule, this, it would be one here, so that's fine, I'll update the timestamp now to two, because I read it, and then I can commit. That's just fine. Transaction T1, now we'll try to do a write, and its timestamp is one, but the read timestamp is greater than him, so therefore it'd be trying to write to an object that, an object in, that a transaction in the future already read and saw the value before T1, so, T1 has to abort because you can't go back and tell T2, go back and rerun this. Like, like you, you read the wrong thing. Right? Because at this point, when I commit, I'm done assuming you know, I, I can send back, you know, I send back acknowledgement to the, to the outside world. Oh, yeah, you read A, here it is. You can't go, go, go and retract that. So T1 will abort, and it'll be just as if T1 never, never existed at all. OK, so the basic timestamp ordering protocol will guarantee that you can generate a schedule that is conflict serializable as long as you don't use the Thomas Wright rule. Um, there are some corner cases where this, the, 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 it'll get violated. I'm not saying Thomas Wright rule always achieves view serializable uh, schedules. I have to check this, but I, I don't think it does. I think there's some corner cases that it can't handle. Um, the, Again, the major difference between this protocol versus the two-phase locking protocols, at least in the case when you're using deadlock detection, right? there can never be any deadlock because no transaction ever waits. Right? It's essentially like the wait and die or wound and wait where you set the timeout to zero. Right? You check to see whether you can do something. You can't. Oh, I'll just go ahead and, and abort myself. Right? 
Now, there's a problem where the, uh, you could have starvation for transactions that try to read a bunch of stuff, and then they, they, they just, other transactions keep modifying the database, uh, and they have timestamps that are in the future. So the longer transaction, by the time it actually gets to do the objects, other objects it wants to modify, some other transaction already sneaked in and already modified these things. So you'd have to keep aborting and restarting over and over again. Another issue that's important to understand uh, for concurrent theory is that timestamp ordering, the protocol that I've described here, permits schedules that are, that are considered non-recoverable. Now, we'll cover this more when we talk about logging recovery in a few weeks. But the basic idea how to un understand recoverability is that if you have a schedule uh, where if you abort one transaction and then another transaction read that, that aborted transactions changes, but that other transaction is already committed, then if you crash or come back and try to replay what happened in the log, you won't be able to actually restore the database to the correct state because the transaction that, that got aborted will not, will not actually not get replayed correctly. So we say a schedule is recoverable uh, if transactions only commit after all the changes uh, that they read from other transactions were, were committed. So I think he in the back asked this question, I think either last class or two classes ago, right? And the way this basically works is that internally the database system knows that I had the read set and the write set of my transaction, and I know my transaction read an object that was modified by this other transaction over here, but this other transaction hasn't committed yet. So I'm going to, even though my transaction said I want to commit, you don't actually do the commit and announce to the outside world your transaction has finished until the transaction that it depends on goes ahead and commits. Right? And we do this to guarantee that we're recoverable. So to use a quick example, say I have transaction T1, it does a write on A, transaction T2 does a read on A, then a write on B, right? If T2 is allowed to read the changes from T1, then if T1 later aborts, uh, this would abort would occur after T2 has committed. So T1 should be as if it never actually existed, but T2 was allowed to read those changes, right? So if at this point here, when T2 commits, if we tell the outside world, yeah, we got what you wanted, here, here's, here's the result, then this schedule is not recoverable because T1 shouldn't actually exist. Right? Another way to think about this, we're, we're violating the serializable guarantee that we would have no dirty reads. Right? Because they're reading uncommitted data. So under time, basic time stamp ordering protocol, uh, you can have non-recoverable schedules. Right, because all the decisions about whether transactions should abort or not occurs by the transaction that is, it would violate the protocol. Because right? there's no locks to say, oh, I need to wait until I can actually do something. I, I was allowed to go ahead and do it. And if some other transaction comes along and says, well, I can't write to this now because uh, somebody else has already read, read to it, then I have to kill myself. But other transaction was, was allowed to run unscathed. Right? All right, so the performance issues of basic timestamp ordering, I would say also, too, that to the best of my knowledge, no database management system actually implements this, uh, as, as I've defined here. Um, again, this is just sort of as a setup for you to understand the more sophisticated protocols. So there is high overhead in implementing this because every single time you read or write to an object, you have to copy it into your workspace. The multi-versioning schemes that we'll talk about later uh, avoid this by being more smart about what they're actually copying when, or, uh, when you actually read or write things. We also talked about how transactions can get starved uh, if they're long running because the likelihood that some other transaction is going to come along and modify something and they have a, a future timestamp than you, then you would come along and try to read that thing, increases the longer you stick around and, and do more, you know, read and write to the, to the database. Now, this isn't so much an issue for disk-based data systems that we're talking about here, but it can be certainly the case in a sort of a, an in-memory data system that's the high performance can run on, on multiple cores and multiple CPUs. We actually done some research which shows that the, the, the allocating the timestamp can actually become a big bottleneck due to cache coherence traffic between the different CPUs. Right, because think about it, if you have a single logical counter that you're doing atomic add over and over again, the atomic add is a single instruction, that's fast, but then invalidating the cache lines 
for any CPU core that has a copy of that counter can, can be really expensive. Okay. So one observation we can make is that if you assume that conflicts are rare between transactions, um, then forcing all the transactions to have to acquire locks under two-phase locking to, before you're allowed to do anything, or always updating the read and write timestamps every single time you, you do anything, uh, this, can be, this can be sort of unnecessary work because the likelihood that transactions will conflict could be rare. Then if you also assume that transactions sh are short-lived, then again, it's sort of related to that, you, conflicts will be rare because most of the times transactions will finish in, in microseconds. So an argument can be made when designing a currency control protocol is that rather than taking the two-phase locking approach where, you're, where you have this pessimistic view that you assume transactions are, are going to conflict, so you make them acquire locks before they're allowed to do anything, even if there never will be a conflict, uh, a better approach could possibly be to say, I'm going to optimize for the most common case where I assume transactions are not going to have conflicts at all, and I'll build a protocol that can be more efficient for that. So that's the motivation or the basic premise behind optimistic concurrency control, or in, in, in abbreviated form, OCC. So this is actually a protocol that was actually developed here at Carnegie Mellon in the 19, early 1980s. I think 19, 1981 is when this paper came out. Uh, and this was invented by H.T. Kung, who uh, was a sort of a net, he was not a database professor at all at CMU. He was actually a networking professor. And somehow they dabbled in databases and it wrote one of the most well-cited papers in, in database literature of all time. Uh, he left CMU, I think, in the early 1990s to go to Harvard. Uh, and it was described to me, he, he, they, they poached him out of CMU to go help build Harvard's uh, uh, CS department, or CS program. Um, famously, Harvard also had another very famous database person, uh, Phil Bernstein, a lot of this sort of core fundamental theory and uh, principles behind concurrency control was actually developed uh, uh, by Phil Bernstein in the late 1970s, early, 1990s, early 1980s. Uh, and he famously got denied tenure at Harvard uh, in like 83, 84. Um, so Harvard CS wasn't that great. And then H.G. Kung was hired to come and sort of rebuild it in the 90s. And this is, this is a really great paper. It's, it's really simplistic. Um, but it lays out the basic ideas of this protocol uh, very clearly. Um, and as we'll see next class, a lot of the newer systems actually use this uh, same protocol that we'll talk about here, but in the context of a, of a multi-version system. All right, so the way M uh, OCC is going to work is that the database system is going to maintain a private workspace for each transaction. We saw this before uh, when I talked about in achieving you know, repeatable reads under basic time save ordering. I said there was a private workspace for the transaction. Right? But if you, again, you want to run it over isolation level, you don't need this. Under OCC, you're always going to have this private workspace. So anytime you read an object or write an object, you always make a copy of that object from the global database, meaning the, the database that everyone can see, and you copy it into your, your private workspace. Right? And no other transaction can see, see the things that you write in your private workspace until they're actually applied to the global database. So then what's going to happen now is when a transaction commits, the database system is going to check to see the, whether the, 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 right, the object you wrote to in your workspace conflict with other transactions that are running at the same time. Um, and if there's no conflicts, then you're allowed to apply those changes to the global database. And then all your changes become visible to any other transaction that comes after you. The other thing I'll this paper, too, is uh, maybe hard to see in the back, is that maybe this is how they did it in the, in the 80s. But they have Carnegie Mellon. They have, they have a hyphen between Carnegie and Mellon, right? Whereas now, we don't do that at all. I always find that interesting every time I see that paper, right? Sort of listed, listed up there. All right, so OCC is defined in terms of phases. And again, this, this part is always confusing for students because the, the name of the phase is kind of not intuitive. Um, and I don't know whether this is because, it's, again, it's coming from someone with a networking background. This is not how I would call things, but if, again, if you read the paper, this is how they describe it. So in the first phase, called the read phase, is where you read and write, not just reads, but write also, objects from the database into your private workspace. 
Right, so again, anytime you, 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 you read a tuple, you make a copy of it, put it into your private workspace. Anytime you write to a tuple, you make a copy of it first, put it into your private workspace. Any inserts you do go, always go into your private workspace. Any deletes are just, you just mark the tuple as you want to delete them in your private workspace. So then now the, 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 the transaction tells the data system, I want to commit. Right, you run the commit command in, in, you know, from the terminal. And then you enter automatically into the validation phase. And here is where, is where the data system is going to check to see whether the changes you have in your private workspace conflict with other transactions that are running at the same time. And you, you can do this by poking or peeking into their private workspace and see what they've done and assess whether it's a lot safe for you to commit. And if everything checks out, then you enter the right phase where now you apply all the changes from your private workspace into the global database. Right? If you fail the validation phase, you basically have to restart the transaction. So another key difference is that the, unlike basic timestamp ordering, where transactions got the timestamp assigned to them immediately when they showed up in the system, under OCC, you don't actually get a timestamp until, until the validation phase. Right? So when you start, you don't have a timestamp. It's only when you say, I want to go to commit, then, then the data system applies as your timestamp to you. All right, so let's walk through a quick example. So here now I'm annotating the schedule with the sort of the, the segments of the correspond to the phases, right? So again, just like under time, uh, two phase locking, where you don't actually say lock this object, you know, in, in different modes, although you, you provide hints in SQL, right? You're not explicitly going to call, I'm in the read phase, or I'm in the validate phase, right? This is something the data system does for you automatically. So I'm showing these, you know, labels here just to, to make it clear what phase we're in at, at different parts of the schedule. So transaction T1 wants to do a read on A, write on A, and transaction T2 just wants to do a, a read on A. So transaction T1 starts, or yeah, the other thing too I'll also point out, in the, in, the, in the database, we no longer have to keep track of the read timestamps. We only need to know the write timestamps for our, for our objects. So, uh, and then we have all the labels here for the, for the different phases. So transaction T1 starts and, and, and enters the read phase. And at this point here, the data system will allocate its private workspace, right? It's just some region of memory that it, it can read and write things to. Then it does a read on A, and what happens here is then we'll copy the object they want to read from the global database into our private workspace. And this includes the, the write timestamp that we got when it, when it came out. So now transaction T2 starts, same thing, it enters the read phase, so we create our uh, private workspace, then it does a read on A as well, and we do the same thing, we copy down the same version of the, I don't use that term, but the same version of the tuple that it existed, uh, that exists in, in the global database. So now when uh, transaction T2 says they want to commit, so this part is always sort of confusing too, I'm having the commit be at the bottom, but essentially after that read, on A, transaction T2 told the data system, I want to commit. So this, the commit I'm listing here is like the physical commit, when the data system actually applies the changes and the transaction is fully finished, truly finished. But when you enter the validate phase, that occurs again when the, the transaction tells the data system, I want to commit. So now, at this point in the validate phase, we'll assign the transaction a timestamp. So now we're going to say here, uh, we'll just assume a simple logical counter, we're just always adding one to it. So transaction T2 is going to get timestamp 1, right? Even though T1 started before T2, T2 is entering the validate, validation phase before T1, so it's going to get timestamp 1. In this case here, I'll describe, I'll describe what the validation phase is in a second, but it's sort of obvious here that uh, both T1 and T2 have only read A, so there can't be any conflicts. So the, it'll complete the validation and go into the right phase, and it can apply any changes that it made, which are, which are none, to the, uh, from its workspace to the global database. And then it, point, it actually truly commits. We tell the outside world, you're done. And we can blow away the T2's workspace. So then now we come back over to T1. It does the write on A. So again, we'll apply our change to the private workspace. But now we'll set its write timestamp to infinity. Because at this point, we're still in the read phase for T1. So it, doesn't have a timestamp, so we just set it some, you know, you know, non-attainable value, right? So then it goes and commits. 
and we enter the validation phase. Now we get our timestamp, right? So now tra t transaction T1 is now assigned tra timestamp 2. Now we look around and see what, you know, are there any, any other transactions running at the same time as us in our validation phase that could, it could conflict with us? In this case, no. So now when it goes, enters the write phase, it, it's now to allow, apply its change up into the global database. And here we set our write timestamp to be the timestamp that was allocated to us, which is two. Yes? Uh, so when you check uh, whether there exists some conflict before you meet your like, comparing it with the database itself or with uh, like other transactions? A few more slides and you, you'll see this. I'm being very hand wavy about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll describe exactly what the validation protocol is in a second. So his question is, are you, is there a guarantee that nothing will happen between the validation phase and the write phase of a transaction? As I'm going to describe it here, we'll be doing our validation in serial ordering. Uh, the, there is some, you know, you could have, well, we'll do validation in serial ordering because that's the easiest way to understand this. But certainly in the write phase, you could have two transactions need to apply a bunch of changes to the database from the private workspace. At that point, we know their timestamp ordering, so we can uh, we can make sure that the the latest timestamp always gets written to the database first, right? For this, we're only about, we're worried about correctness, so just assume there's a global mutex for, for applying these changes. But in the if you want to do parallel fast OCC validation, it's a bit more tricky. You do things like you order the keys in a certain way, so there's no like deadlocks when you apply when you acquire latches to do writes and things like that. In the back. Your question is: Is validation only done by transaction when it's in the validation phase? So I think your question is. If, if one transaction is in the validation phase, do you do it? Do you do a comparison with other transactions that are also in the same validation phase? Okay. So, next slide. Validation. Well, let me walk through this, and then if you're still confused, we can uh, we can we can um, we can go over it again. I'll also say too. I, I forgot to check on the. So another thing too is in the book. I think they call this uh, validation protocols, right? So they have. Two-phase locking protocols, timestamp ordering protocols, as, as, as I've described here. And then they also have a, a second sort of subchapter called validation protocols, where they describe OCC. Technically, that's not really true, because it's, it's a timestamp ordering protocol, because we're using timestamps to figure out the ordering of things. So the big part of making, figuring out how OCC works is through the validation phase. I'll also say, too, that I'm going to describe how to do validation in one direction. You actually can do it in both directions. And for this, it doesn't matter that you can do both directions. If you just understand the basic idea of what's going on, we, you, know, you can kind of see easily how it can be flipped in the other direction. And then we're also going to do this in serial order, which makes this way easier to understand. The parallel version is more complicated. OK, so in the validation phase is, is the key part of this. Is that's we're going to guarantee that uh, we only have, we only generate schedules that interleave operations in, in, in serializable ordering. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to have our transaction that wants to commit it's going to check other transactions uh, for read-write or write-write conflicts, and then make sure that our conflicts only go in one direction. So that means that the older transactions, we always want to have older transactions conflict with, if there's a conflict between the older transaction and the newer transaction, we'll make a decision whether to abort a particular transaction based on the age of the timestamp that we're given to it. Right? And we saw this before with deadlock prevention. Right, under wound and wait and wait and die, we, we have the protocol make decisions about whether one transaction is allowed to proceed or not, whether you should board the other guy. And it always has to be in the same order, right? from oldest to youngest or youngest to oldest. Because if you mix them, then you can have, uh, then you end up with incorrect orderings. And as I said before, for all of this, that for simplicity, we're going to assume that we're going to do validation and the writing in serial ordering. Uh, and we'll just use a simple mutex or latch to protect, you know, protect this critical section of the system, right? During the read phase, you don't have to worry about this, right? Because you just write to your private workspace, right? And anything you read from the global database, is, you know this from a committed transaction, uh, and you know you're doing this in, in proper serializable ordering, so you don't have to set any latches or mutexes when, when you actually do any reads. All right.
So the validation phase has three steps. And again, when a transaction enters the validation phase, we're always going to assign it a timestamp. And the timestamp is always going to be unique, and it's always increasing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check the order of our committing transactions with all other running transactions. So we're going to look in their private workspace and see what's going on inside of them and see whether we're going to conflict with them. And if, if so, then we're going to go ahead and kill ourselves. So this is what I was saying. You can do sort of forward validation or backwards validation. So what I mean by that is this is backwards validation. It's, sorry, this is forward validation because you're looking at transactions forward in the future to see if, whether if I commit, I'm going to com if I commit, I would cause a conflict, and therefore I should abort myself. In backwards validation, you check to see whether you've made changes that would that would conflict with transactions that that have already committed in the past. The basic idea is the same for this one. We're going we're going we're, again. We're always going to go in one direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to check to see uh, uh, if our timestamp is less than any other timestamp that is uh, that we can reading from from an, on an object. Then we have to check to see whether our, these conditions hold. Now, remember I said before we set the timestamp of the object we wrote to in our private workspace to infinity. So that's, what, that's why these, these timestamps are always going to be larger than whatever the timestamp we are trying to commit with. And if, we, if that's true, then we know that we're actually trying to write to the same object that somebody read to, and therefore we shouldn't be allowed to commit. All right, so in the first phase, it's pretty simple. If the transaction that we're trying to commit finishes all three phases, read, validation, and write, before the other transaction we're comparing against even actually does anything, then we know that the validation was, will succeed. Right? It's essentially just, do you have a serial ordering? Right? So T1 starts as read, write, and validate. And then we know about T2, but T2 actually hasn't read anything yet. So it technically hasn't started the read phase. So they can never possibly conflict, because this is sort of a sort of trivial serial ordering. So this is fine, right? We know that we're not going to conflict with our transaction, so we can go ahead and commit T1. The next one is that if T1 completes uh, before TJ starts his write phase, and T, TI, excuse me, completes before T, TJ starts his write phase, and TI did not read anything, sorry, did not write anything that was read by T, TJ, then we know that there cannot be a rewrite conflict. So our, TI is allowed to commit. And more informally, you can write this if the write set of TI, right, you look in the private workspace and say, here's all the objects that I wrote to. If that write set, when intersected with the read set of another transaction, if, there are, if, that's, if that's null, meaning there's, there's no overlap at all, then there can't possibly be a conflict. Because TI would have written something that TJ didn't, never read, so we're fine. Right? So more, so implicit, more simplistic like this, like uh, in this case here, we enter, we enter the validation phase uh, for T, TI, sorry, T1. T1 read on A and wrote, wrote to A. And now we have in our, our workspace, we have the object A with our write timestamp set to infinity. So now in our validation, we would check in, for T1, would go check inside of T2. And inside of T2, you would see, oh, well, I read to object A. So the read set of T1, sorry, the read set of T2 intersects with the write set of T1. So therefore, T1 has to, has to abort, right? So even though T2 will never actually write to anything, and uh, this is still would be a conflict here. Because when T2 read A, it read the version that existed in the global database before T1 started executing. So therefore, it's reading an, uh, an object in the past, but then T1 wants to overwrite that with a newer version, but T2 won't see that because it wasn't applied to the global database yet. So, th so th this, this will violate our guarantee. All right, so now do a, uh, another example here. Or is this the same one? Sorry. Right, in this case here, sorry. Uh, This is exact opposite of what I just showed, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. T1 does the read on A, write on A, and then T2 does the read on A, but then it does validation. And then that point, it gets a timestamp of 
say, two, or sorry, one, T1 then does its validation after T2 does its validation. And in this case here, it's going to get timestamp two. So that's okay because T2 read the object as it existed at timestamp zero. And it has timestamp one. So it can't see anything that, that has a timestamp greater than one, which would be two, which is for T1. So therefore, this is safe to commit uh, because the validation of T1 occurred after the validation of T2. Um, and therefore, this is, this is a correct serializable ordering, even though T1 started again before T2. Okay, so that's the second step. The third step is that uh, if T1, T, TI completes its read phase for TJ, completes its read phase, and TI does not write to any object that is either read or written to by TJ, then, then we can go ahead and commit. This is essentially an extension of the previous one where now we're including, including uh, the write set. And the, uh, the idea is basically the same here, right? So if uh, T1 reads an A, writes on A, T2 reads on B, and then reads, reads A, if we get to here and we validate, then at this point, uh, we don't see in the private workspace of T2 the object A because it hasn't been read yet. So this is fine. Uh, and T1's allowed to commit, right? And then when T2 does its validation, it's okay that it read, um, so it's okay that it, it read the older version uh, of B because T1 didn't write to it. Um, but then they read the new version A. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. At this point, the write phase of T1 gets installed in the database, right? So T1 does the write into A, A and then updates the object in the database. Now T2 does the read on A, and it'll get the version that, that T1 wrote into, right? And therefore, that's OK. That's serializable. And, it, and it's validation. Uh, T1 is not running anymore, so there's nothing to check. And it's go ahead. It's safe for a lot to commit this. So even though, again, the, the write on A occurred uh, while T2 was already running, but by, by the time we got to the validation, the change got applied to the global database. Uh, no one else has read, had tried to read that object yet, so that's okay. So now when T2 reads that object, it gets the correct version. And we guarantee that everything's serializable. All right, so an obvious question is, this is more sophisticated than basic timestamp ordering. When does OCC work well? When, when do we actually want to use this? And as I said in the beginning, this works well when the, the number of conflicts are, are low. Because right? if you have a lot of conflicts between tr transactions, when you actually do the validation, you, you keep avoiding the transaction over and over again, and you would never actually, you barely ever complete anything. Right? So this works well when, when, the, uh, when the transactions are updating distinct things, and then go ahead and do validation and commit without any problems. His question is, if your transaction is, is read-only, do you still have to check the other transactions? Um, in the, the example I showed here, if your transaction is read-only, you don't have to check anybody else. Because other, other transactions will have to check to see whether they've conflicted with you. Because in this case here, you've read a consistent snapshot of the database because you're making sure you always read it, at, you know, it, you only read objects that are actually committed. You can still have phantoms, which I'm ignoring for this for now. Uh, the, other, it's gonna, the idea is that the, it's up to the other transactions that do the writes to see whether they call, would cause a problem with you, and then they abort themselves. If you're, if you're read-only, things are just fine. Um, again, so the, the main motivation for this was setting locks for things that are never going to have conflicts anyway is an expensive operation because, again, you go on the lock manager, you have to you know, set a latch on that, then acquire the, um, and then, and the, you know, acquire the lock that you want, do whatever it is your transaction needs to do, and then go back and release it, which again acquires more latches. Uh, if you don't think there's going to be conflicts, then you wouldn't want to use OCC because the only time we actually need to apply a, uh, to get a latch for anything is that 
is when we actually apply the changes to the global database. Because I can copy things in my private workspace without worrying about any latches because you know the transaction is, has exclusive access to it. So the problem with OCC, though, is that there's some overhead involved with copying data locally. Um, the write phase and validation phase and the write phase can become a bottleneck unless you parallelize it. But even then, there's always going to be some contention point where you have to make sure that you know, one transaction is only allowed to apply the changes to the particular objects in the database. The other big issue is that in the case of OCC, you're making the decision about whether a transaction has to abort at the end of it, at the validation phase. Right? Under two-phase locking, if I need to acquire a million locks and I can't get the first one, again, depending on what protocol I'm using, the data system could decide right then and there, I'm not gonna, you, know, you can't acquire this lock, I'm going to abort you and restart you. Under OCC, if I need to acquire, update a million things, I'll update all one million things, and then, then I go check my validation phase, that's when I figure out, oh, I have a conflict, I need to abort myself. Uh, so I've just done a bunch of wasted work. So OCC does aborting at the end, where it's in two-phase locking, you, you can abort at any moment in it. And the sooner the better, because then you're not wasting cycles doing useless work. And the same thing as we saw in basic time stamp ordering protocol in a highly concurrent multi-socket CPU environment, allocating these unique timestamps for, for transactions can become a bottleneck. Okay. So any questions about OCC? Yes. Your question is, your question is, we're going to assume there's nothing can occur in the database between the validation phase and the write phase. Yes, in this particular example, yes. Right? Assume there's a, glo it's a serial order, there's a, there's a single latch you acquire to say, I'm now in the validation phase. Do your validation. If it passes, then you do all your updates. Then you release that. If you want to do it in parallel, you have to, it's a, a bit more tricky. You can do things like, you can order the, uh, you can order the, the, the you, you can, sort the order of, of acquiring latches on objects that you don't want to write in sort of some lexicographic ordering so that multiple threads running at the same time are always doing their, their validation and application of the changes in the same direction. That's, that's a bit more you want to cover in, the, in this class, though. Yes? So his statement is, why can't you just do like a speculative validation? You do that, sure. But then it's, it's, it's like, then you have, so you can, do, you can do it speculatively. And then, yeah, you can decide, oh, I think I'm going to abort. So don't even bother acquiring the latch. Then do the true validation. You could do that, but again, you're burning cycles. And if you assume that your conflicts are rare, which is what you would want to assume if you're running an OCC, then you're, doing, you're doubling the amount of work you have to do for validation. So there's trade-offs, right? There's no free lunch for this. Okay. So uh, the overarching theme that I'm, I'm glossing over of, of the, the way you implement these things is there's all these internal data structures we have to, to, we have to maintain to figure out whether the transactions are doing the right thing. And this is not, true, not just true for time stable ordering, it's also true for two-phase locking. Right? Two-phase locking, you have, you have a latch on the lock table, right? and internal things, the internal queues, you have latches on those. Uh, in time stamp ordering, uh, you have to have a latch when you enter the validation phase or the write phase. Right? And we, we have to do this because we have to check to see whether we have a conflict between another tr transaction that's running at the same time and avoid race conditions on our internal data structures. Right? So if we have a a lot of concurrent transactions, even if they don't conflict, uh, then doing all of this extra work is, is expensive. And then we already talked about you know, crabbing, latch crabbing in indexes last week. right? If you have all these transactions that have to update all these indexes, they have to take all the latches when they go down to, to want to apply your changes. So you're, applying, you're acquiring latches for internal data structures as well as the indexes and whatever else is going on in the system. So this is really expensive. So an alternative is to split the database up in such a way where you'll allow transactions to run 
where you know they, they're not going to conflict with other transactions, and therefore you don't have to check uh, check a bunch of transactions. You only have to check the ones that are sort of within your your domain or region. All right, I think we already talked about partitioning before. The basic idea is we're going to take our database or tables, and we're going to split it up into these disjoint subsets called partitions. And then now when we have transactions running at a partition, we only have to check uh, tr our transactions running at that partition. We don't have to check it all the other partitions. Under OCC, as I described, I have to check every transaction's workspace that, that, that are going on inside of the system. But if I can uh, limit the scope of how, what I have to check, then I have to check fewer things, and I can run much faster. So in a lot of OTP applications, this is actually very easy to do. Because in a lot of OTP applications, the database is easily partitionable. So to give you an example, so this is the schema from the TPCC benchmark that some of you will be running in the, for the extra credit. Right? It's, it's an old benchmark. It's from, the, it's from 1992. But in talking with people in industry, a lot of times, a lot of applications actually look like this. Right? So the way to, so this, the application this is modeling is a sort of order processing system. Think of like an Amazon store. Right? So you have a warehouse. A warehouse has district. A district has customers. And customers have orders. And orders have order items. Right? And so the, the, just to take these two tables, the warehouse and district table, there's sort of this natural dependency between these uh, different tables. Right? So in the warehouse, the warehouse, is a where, warehouse has a warehouse, warehouse ID. And then a district, since it belongs to that warehouse, it has to have a warehouse, warehouse ID as well. So it's going to have a foreign key reference to the warehouse table. And this will occur all the way down from the customer, because the, the, the customer has to belong to a district. And therefore, you have a warehouse ID for the customer, because you have to know what district it's in. Uh, and the same for order, orders and order items. Stock is a, has a dependency on the, on the warehouse table. And so what you can do is you can generate partitions where you basically take the warehouse ID of every single tuple, and you use that to assign it to a particular partition. So for warehouse ID 1, all the, the, the district's records, the customer records, the order, order's record, and the order item records, with that same warehouse ID equals 1, will get put into one partition. The same thing for two, three, and so on. The only uh, uh, sort of anomaly to this is the item table here, because the items are sort of global, and they're not assigned to a particular warehouse. So what we're going to end up doing is replicating that on every single partition, which I'll show in the next slide. So this is very, also very common in OTP applications. Right? There's often these sort of small read-only or read-mostly tables that don't fit nicely into our partitioning scheme, but we want to use uh, in all different scenarios for all the transactions. So zip code is another great example. Right? Zip code only has, I think, 30,000. In the US, there's only 35,000 zip codes. The post office only updates them four times a year. But you need to use the zip code you know, table in all sorts of transactions to update addresses and things like that. So in that case, you would, you would replicate the zip code uh, table everywhere. So let's see how we want to assign this now, this, our, our, these, our data to partitions. So for this, we'll assume we have four partitions. And again, this is going to be, we're basically doing horizontal partitioning. We're, we're going to slice up uh, rows of tuples and assign them to different partitions. So that all the tuples from a particular warehouse will appear in one partition, and all the tuples from another warehouse will, will appear in another partition. So say that we split this up between four partitions. Partition one goes here, partition two goes there, and, and so forth. And then we're going to replicate the item table at every single, uh, every single partition. So now what happens if I have a transaction that wants to update, you know, place an order for a customer, right? You would look up and say, well, what warehouse is that customer in? And then you could direct your transaction to just that one partition, do all your changes there, and you don't have to check any of the other partitions because you know they can't conflict because they're not updating anything in your, in your warehouse. So this is the basic idea of partition-based timestamp ordering. And the particular variant I'm going to show them, show you, is uh, specific to these couple systems here. So you could take OCC, for example, and run it in a partition-based cluster, or partition-based de deployment, where you know, if you assume transactions are not going to touch each other, or touch data from different partitions, when you do your validation, you, have to, you don't have to check them.
But what I'm describing here now is actually a very specific protocol that rigidly enforces these partition boundaries and will have a single threaded execution engine assigned to each partition that can only execute one transaction at a time. And so now you don't need to do any, any validation. You don't need to do any private workspace. You don't need to do any crabbing or, or latching on any data structure because that thread is the only thing that's running for that particular partition. No other transaction is running at the same time. So you don't need any, any of those, all the protection mechanisms that we, we've been talking about so far. Right, so another way to think about this is that the partition uh, is protected by a, a coarse grain single lock. And what happens is that lock is assigned to transactions in timestamp ordering. So if you're, if you're the oldest transaction with the oldest timestamp in the system, then you're granted that lock. And then you're allowed to run to completion without worrying about any other transaction running at the same time. Right? So this, this, this idea is pretty old. It's actually a paper from like uh, 1992 or so that describes that you could do this. Uh, in the 90s, there was a system called uh, Smallbase, which eventually became Time Sand out of Oracle, although they don't do this anymore, but in the original version they did. Uh, we had the KDB guy uh, at CMU two weeks ago. Their system in the, in the 90s, actually, and I think even now, still does this. You have the single-threaded engine. Uh, I was in grad school when I helped build a system called HDOR, and HDOR sort of takes this to the extreme and does it on a distributed environment. So you have partition, multiple partitions per machine, uh, and you can have transactions at each machine run, run in isolation of everyone else. And then HDOR was then forked and commercialized as VoltDB. So VoltDB is the commercial implementation of HDOR. And then uh, earlier this year, there's a system called FaunaDB that came out. Um, they don't do exactly what I'm describing here. Um, they, do sort of, they do sort of what he was proposing before, where you do speculatively execute transactions, figure out what they're, what they're going to do ahead of time, and then you assign a partition, you assign a lock to a partition based on a batch, and you allow them to run completion without worrying about interleaving. But at a high level, it's essentially doing, doing the same thing. So to do reads, transaction, you, you can read anything you want at, at the partition as long as you have the lock for it. So if I only need to touch the data at warehouse one, and as soon as I get the lock for that partition for warehouse one, I can read anything I want, uh, and I don't have to check anything. If I try to then access data at another partition, like I, I need to read something at partition or warehouse two, then I have to abort my transaction, restart it, and then when the transaction starts the and comes around the second time, you have to tell the data system, I need locks at, par at partition one and partition two. Right, you have to get all the locks you need before the trans transaction is allowed to run. And this is an okay assumption to make in a lot of OLTP applications, because a lot of times that, you know, most transactions are only going to need to touch data at a single partition if you partition it correctly. For writes, the same thing. Uh, we can apply our changes in place. I mean, we just overwrite whatever the current version of the of the tuple it is, because we know nobody else is running at the same time. Nobody else can read our writes. So it doesn't matter that we, uh, that we, we apply our changes and now they're globally visible, because they're, they're kind of, they're not. We still have to maintain an undo buffer in case we abort a transaction, because you need to be able to roll back those changes and put it back to the, to the correct state. But again, we don't have to do any validation or make sure that there's any conflicts, because we know only one transaction is running at the same time. And the same thing as before in the reads, if you try to write to a partition you don't have a lock for, then you have to abort, come back, and acquire those locks before you're allowed to run. To run. So this particular protocol, this partition-based timestamp ordering, is probably the fastest way you can execute uh, transactions in a database system. Um, because there are no, there's, all, there's no overhead of checking latches, checking for conflicts, Private, making copies you know, in your private workspace, you're sort of almost going at bare metal speed. Right? It's essentially this, almost the same thing as just having a single thread for the entire database and having that do all the reads and writes. And obviously that would, would not be able to parallelize and take, take, take advantage of new cores and multiple machines. Um, so this is sort of like the, the next best thing. The other thing I didn't really talk about here is that this only really works if you execute every transaction as stored procedures. Because if a transaction acquires the lock for the partition, but then you got to go back and forth over the network through JDBC and say, what's the next query I want to run? What's the next query I want to run? Then that's going to delay the amount of time that that partition is locked. 
and it's gonna, you're going to actually run in worse than you would if you actually interleaved your operations. So this is only really works if you have uh, store procedures. It also only really works well if you have most of your transactions, if not all of them, are only touch data at a single partition. Because if you have touch data at multiple partitions, what will happen is, you'll acquire, it's the same thing as the network problem, you acquire the lock for the other partition, you do most of your changes to that, your one partition, and then the other partition is idle waiting for the next query to run. Now you can get around this with spec execution and other things, but that's again, beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here. So a system like VoltDB works really, really well and probably is the fastest system you could possibly have. And, I'm, and you know, I realize it's based on HR, so that sounds like I'm biased. But the studies show it is actually the fastest system you can have if all your transactions are single partitioned. I don't know what it is for in their numbers, uh, but if, if it gets around 10% of your transactions have to touch multiple partitions, then you're, you're better off using a OCC or timestamp ordering protocol, sorry, OCC or two-phase locking protocol that we've talked about so far. Right, this is sort of a specialized case where this is the, in, you know, if most of your transactions can be single partition, this is the best way to go. Otherwise, you use these other protocols. So any questions about this? I know that there's one group for the extra credit that has signed up to do uh, the run experiments for extra credit for VoltDB. It'd be interesting to see how, how they compare against, uh, against some of the other systems. Okay. So just to reiterate, uh, every concurrent serial protocol that's out there uh, can be essentially broken down into its sort of fundamental operations into either two-phase locking or, or the timestamp ordering, ordering protocol that I've shown here in the last two lectures. Right? There's, there, there really isn't another way to do, uh, you know, to, to, to schedule or interleave operations. Right? It's either pessimistic where you prevent them from doing it before they're allowed to do it, or optimistic where you check after they've done it whether they were allowed to do it. And you use locks for the first one and timestamps for the second one. Yes? Um, given the trade-offs with all these concurrency control protocols uh, based on different workloads, if you have a database that has varying workloads, can you mix and match protocols or do you have to decide a priori, I'm going to use locking or I'm going to use timestamps? So his question is, um, can you mix these protocols uh, inside of the same, same system for transactions that uh, keep it simple. Say you have a single database, but I have you know, sort of two applications accessing the same database at the same time. Can I have some of the application transactions run at two base locking and some of them run on our timestamp ordering? Uh, as far as I know, no commercial data system does that. And part of the reason is that it's actually really hard to implement these things. So you'd have to implement two-phase locking correctly. Then you got to also implement OCC or, or timestamp ordering correctly, right? And I, so a, from an engineering standpoint, that's, that's really hard to do. So nobody does that. From a correctness standpoint, uh, I, I, yes, but uh, in very limited cases. So, MySQL sort of does this. MySQL does two-phase locking. But what they do is you get a timestamp when the transaction starts, and you're allowed to read older versions without having to acquire the lock. Right? Uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they're doing that through timestamps. Um, the, there are some research systems that can figure out things like, all right, well, I'll observe the application, and I'll run it under OCC, when there's no conflicts, but if my conflict rate goes up, then I'll flip a switch and internally I switch over to two-phase locking. I don't know whether uh, they can intermix things. I would say in practice it's hard. There, it's only for special cases I think you can do this. It's a good question though. So another thing I'm not showing in, in any of these lectures is that I'm not showing any benchmark results. And I'm doing this because at this point I care about correctness. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about where, where the performance bottlenecks are, uh, but if I showed you any graph and say, like, here's TPCC running on these different protocols, right, I don't want you guys to get a, uh, uh, have the impression that, oh, two-phase locking is terrible, we don't want to do that, we want to use OCC, right, because I can show you benchmark numbers where OCC actually does better than two-phase locking, and I can show you other benchmark numbers where two-phase locking does better. Um, so 
in the advanced class, we'll talk a little bit about you know, understanding at a more fine-grained level what could be the bottlenecks or limitations of these different protocols. Uh, but in practice, there's not one that's better than, a, than another, right, that, that for all possible applications. The other thing I'll say, too, is that at its lowest level, if you have extreme conflict, meaning every single transaction was execute, that executes wants to write to the same object, then these, these two-phase locking and, and timestamp ordering basically digress to be the, exactly the same thing. Right? You end up with just executing transactions in serial order. So again, if, if your application has a low conflict rate, OCC might be better. Or if your, conflict, if your transactions want to run for longer, then two-phase locking might be better. Right? There's, no, there's no one thing I can point to say, if you don't if remember, if you forget everything in this class, just remember this, two-phase locking is the best, right? I, 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 there's nothing I can say that, that would, uh, uh, there's nothing I can show you that could justify such a statement. Um, Different database systems do different things. In addition to just sort of the underlying protocol, you know, whether it's two-phase locking or time-stamp ordering, there's a bunch of really low-level details of how you actually implement these things that can make a big difference, right? And we'll see this when we talk about MV MVCC in next class, but it's the same high-level protocol, but whether you use a hash table or a tree structure for your locks, right, all these things can, you know, can, can affect performance. All right, so with that, again, so on, on, on Wednesday, we'll start talking about uh, multi-version concurrency control. And again, this is another aspect of, of database systems and the literature where this is confusing. So there is no protocol called multi-version concurrency control in the sense of it's not separate from timestamp ordering or two-phase locking. So you can do a multi-version concurrency protocol that uses a timestamp ordering protocol or that uses a two-phase locking protocol. So multi-versioning is also a another way to sort of architect the system of how you retain information about what's going on inside of the system. But at the high level, again, it's still just either two-phase locking or, or, or timestamp ordering. So that's what we'll discuss on, 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 next, on next, ne next class. And as a preview, I'll say that this is essentially, what I'll describe next class is pretty much what every single database system that was written in the last 10 years actually uses. The only exception to this would be FaunaDB and VoltDB Everything else that you can possibly name is going to be using uh, a variant of MVCC. And we can discuss why that's actually the case or not. OK? Yes? Yeah, so his, his statement is, and I, again, I, I would agree with this, a concurrency protocol has to be either two-phase locking or timestamp ordering. It has to be either pessimistic you think transactions are, are a conflict, so you prevent them from doing the thing that would cause conflict before they're allowed to do it. Or you assume transactions are not going to conflict, so you let them run along, and then only when they go to commit do you check around to what was going on at the same time you ran, would that cause a problem or not? So it's either, either one or the other. And how you actually implement them right, can vary a lot. Right? You can use a queues for your locks, you can use a tree, you can do validations with a, with a graph. So we're sitting, what, what, would, what would be representative, what would be a locking scheme that's not two-phase locking? Yeah. It has to be two-phase locking. If you want to guarantee conflict serializable schedules, it has to be two-phase locking. The Jim Gray paper from 1976 proves, and some of Phil Bernstein's later work proves that it has to be two-phase locking. Right, because otherwise you hit, you hit the, the, the issues that we showed before. Right, and sort of it's intuitive, right? Like if I release locks and try to come back and, and try to acquire more locks, someone else could have you know, could, could have updated the database before, you know, in, in, in between them. I'm going to violate serializable ordering. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys. And then we'll check about the uh, project three for the, the, the weight die that's missing after the class. All right. Thanks. See ya.